Hello everybody, my name is Brady and I'm a 19th century American historian and we are back with another React video. Today we're going to be doing more from BuzzFeed, which I haven't done in a little bit. BuzzFeed is in the history game, they have so much content on history, I'm surprised I haven't gone back to them. They're a bit of a weird source, they have a young audience, but I kind of appreciate that because anybody who tries to make history fun and entertaining for younger people, I mean it's an admirable goal. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of other things they could be putting their time and resources into that would probably be more popular. So this should be fun. Uh, the video is called That Time Britain Burned Down the White House. So we're talking about the War of 1812. This is in my area of study, fortunately. And one of the most interesting points in American history, in my opinion. This is where we go from the founding era to what comes after we start getting into like the jacksonian era for lack of better term uh yeah this is really an amazing turning point i'm very excited to talk about it this video should be really cool let's get it started Welcome to Ruining History. Today we're going to talk a lot and learn a little about the War of 1812. Guys, that's a, it's a weird war. What war was it? It was the War of 1812. He said that. <laughs> Jeez, it's loud there. You don't know the basics of it? Nothing. I, I know the basics. It was in 1812. I know nothing about history or why I was invited to talk about it. The there's an interest, I, I kind of like the idea of this show where you have one person who knows history talking to a bunch of people who don't really know history that well because uh, people who don't know history, uh, it's not like they don't have anything to add. They actually have an interesting advantage with a blank slate. They, they, they are able to make observations that historians often take for granted because we... Uh, learn about things a certain way and we get used to thinking about things a certain way though there are some people who are really good at thinking outside the box you you come to accept certain ways of thinking thinking about things uh, some of my favorite classmates are new history majors because they'll ask the questions that I don't even think to ask so uh, I like the idea of this show it seems interesting Al Capone had anything to do with it. Al Capone, he comes into the story a little later. Yeah. That's a century off or so. This is almost like the sequel to the Revolutionary War. That's a good way to point it out. Is that a better way to pitch it? I don't know what's happening there. When it comes to American history, the War of 1812 is kind of an outlier. It was once described as, quote, the bucktooth stepsister of American military victories. But so the War of 1812, if you don't know... America is going to claim the victory, but it's not a very good victory even if it is one. I always look at the War of 1812 as, at best, a draw. Uh, we have two armies that are wasting a whole bunch of resources and really not getting a whole lot out of it. So, really, I think it's, it's either a draw or we could just say everybody loses. Uh, it does assert a certain level of power from the Americans, they're not necessarily a superpower, and they're not going to be for a very long time. Uh, but they, in the end, were able to gain a little bit of dignity, but they also lose a little bit of dignity in situations like this, with the burning of the White House, which is one of the biggest disgraces on James Madison's presidency. But there's one aspect of the War of 1812 that probably sticks out to some people. The part where British troops physically stormed Washington, D.C. and actually set it on fire. So, let's talk about that. The year Let was 1812, that. obviously. And things in the Atlantic were a bit chopped out. The British were locked in a war with Napoleon. And the Royal Navy had made a habit of kidnapping U.S. soldiers by the thousands. So in the American Revolution, uh, France was America's ally. They're not our ally in this case. So we are fighting the British alone, but with the French. It's weird. It's like stuff has changed, but it's also not. Uh, the English and the French are going to be fighting over there. We're going to be fighting over here. And that's a very interesting thing because once the... Uh, once the French are out of the picture, it's the true test of America's power. How much have you developed in this pretty short period of time? James Madison is only the fourth president, so uh, and 
uh, we've already had one one-term president. Uh, so, not much time. Let, let's be real. And forcing them to work on their warships. How the hell they kidnap with that? Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Because that is a very important The British were locked in a war with Napoleon, and the Royal Navy had made a habit of kidnapping U.S. soldiers by the thousands and forcing them to work on their warships. How the hell they kidnap a thousand sailors? They were capturing them a thousand at once. I thought you met a <laughs> ship of a thousand people, and they're like, come on in. Th this is why it's good to have uh, pe uh, other people in the room, so you make sure you're communicating it in a way that makes sense to them, because they're thinking about it very abstractly in the early stages of trying to understand history. So, like, I, I like that they're there to ask these questions and get this clarification. Uh, I If I'm thinking abstractly, I could imagine a thousand uh, people being kidnapped, but I know for a fact that that's just not how they did it. Impressment was kind of necessary by the British. Nobody really wants to be in the British Navy at this point. It's an awful, awful way to live your life. Um, and so they end up taking American citizens, uh, and they're, and they're like, oh, you're a run, a British runaway, uh, you need to come back here and start working for us, and it's, it's a bit cynical after a little while. At first you're like, okay, you want to just go get your runaways, that's fine, and there definitely are some, but... Yeah, there, it gets to the point where it's like, okay, you're just kidnapping Americans at this point. What are you doing? I had one of those oh, big okay. Finding Nemo nets. Only <laughs> yeah. I just capture a gaggle of U.S. soldiers. I've got to take this off. All this sailor Getting talk. Get, just... Yeah, woo. <laughs> International <laughs> relations were further intensifying due to Britain's ongoing trade competition with France. A snooty British diplomat summed it up. While we are aiming blows at the French Marine, we want elbow room. And these good neutrals won't give it to us. And therefore, they get a few side pushes which make them grumble. However, I hope that they will see their interests better than to seriously quarrel with us. <laughs> Let's talk about who America should be siding in at this point. Uh, fighting against the British is very difficult here uh, because they are your biggest trade partner. You are trading with both Britain and France, but the thing about France, you're not getting as many essential goods. A lot of what you get from France are luxury goods. What you get from uh, the British is highly essential. So going to war with the British it's not ideal. And we have Thomas Jefferson who's going to try to uh, flex his muscles a little bit when he's president and be like, hey, we have, we, we have trade power too. And no, you, you, you can't push the British around at this point. They have the economic power right now. People seriously talk like that because I'm exhausted. I like I don't know what you just said to me. He's just saying, I "Look, understand. we're sorting our shit out with France, and these idiot Americans are annoyed because it's interfering with their business." but obviously they're not dumb enough to get into a war with us. If that British hmm. diplomat hoped Americans would remain calm and collected, he was sorely mistaken. Yes. Congressman, future vice president, and as far as I can tell, vampire John C. Calhoun said that he much preferred, quote, war with all its accompanying evils to abject submission. John C. Calhoun is an evil human being. Uh, he's going to be vice president under two different presidents, and uh, he's going to have a lot to do with the nullification crisis, where people are trying to decide, does the Constitution override individual states' rights? Can the state just decide, hey, we're not going to follow the Constitution because it's BS, um, and he's going to have a lot to do with that, and Andrew Jackson's going to want to shoot him in the face. It's great. Um <laughs> This is when a lot of new people are coming up, though. We have the War Hawks. A lot, this younger generation of people getting in, getting political power that are separate from the founding generation, have their own interests, and uh, have grown up with a... have actually, uh, yeah, I guess grown up a little bit more with America as an idea. Uh, while the founders begin as British subjects. A lot of these people uh, may have been British subjects when they're pretty darn young, but through their uh, most important years of growth, they are Americans. So that's interesting. <laughs> 
apologies to John C. Calhoun. Don't apologize. He'll be fine. To rise, president James Madison, the fourth president of the United States. Look at those fourth shoulders. President of the United States? He was the fourth. Yeah. Does everyone know when America was founded? 1776. Same, I knew that too. Did you know that? No. I'm like, wow, we're really You're early in American history. Yeah. This is why I don't know why I was invited here. Let it it's be okay. That's the one thing we knew. That was the only time everyone has all chimed in. With tensions continuing to rise, President James Madison declared war against Britain in June of 1812. And America was not fun. stoked. A good portion of the population, particularly the folks in New England, were still sympathetic to Britain. Many of them were in active opposition right. to the war. So why were they still uh, on England's side here? Was this maybe like when there's a divorce in the family and some of the kids have to live with mom, but they kind of want to live with dad still? We need Kylo Ren to scream yeah. traitor at them. Guys, can you stop talking about Star Wars? <laughs> What's wrong with talking about Star Wars? I can't stop. Many people wouldn't. We were not that far removed from almost going to war with France at this point. So we're, we have the revolution, we're at war with Great Britain, and France is on our side. And then we have uh, uh, the quasi-war, where we end up having a little bit of trouble with France, which it, it was kind of a war, but not really a big war or whatever at sea. And we almost went to war with France, so we're not really good buddies with them in the same way we used to be. And uh, the Democratic, Republican, and Federalist parties are kind of divided between the two. While the Democratic Republicans like the ideals of France, the uh, Federalists uh, appreciated the tactical advantages of having England as a partner. I've already talked about the trade benefits, but England was generally more powerful and more stable. Think of everything that France went through around this time. They they went through an awful revolution. Their, their revolution was not as conservative as the Americans, and there was lots and lots of blood. Uh, I guess America had a lot of blood, too. We had like a full-out war, but uh, the executions were a very uh, ugly image even contribute to war loans and instead invested their money in Britain. So you can understand why a visitor to the White House described Madison as looking, quote, miserably shattered and woebegone. His mind is full of the New England sedition. I mean, he was a gloomy dude to begin with. Let, let's just let's just acknowledge that. Uh, things will get worse for him, by the way. I'm bringing back the word woebegone. Woebegone's good. What the fuck is yeah, woebegone? That's a, that's a <laughs> it's like, just like five dollar word. I'm gonna use that shit. Yeah, if you're having a, a day where you're feeling kind of <laughs> glum, and I run into you in the canteen, and I say, how, how you go? How's you? <laughs> I say, <laughs> how you going? <laughs> then he has a brain aneurysm and he dies. <laughs> I pass out, and then you'll be woebegone. <laughs> you do, 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 do. It's pretty With fine. the fall of Napoleon in 1814, Britain suddenly had more forces to throw at their ongoing conflict with the U.S. So this is the real test for the United States. And uh, Britain is definitely weakened at this point. They, they've they been through a lot. Everybody's been through a lot these past couple decades. France, Great Britain, and the United States. We're, we're all really struggling right now. Uh, we're all trying to build back what we once had. So nobody is at full power at this point. Uh, but given the circumstances of the time, this is the closest we get to a fair fight between uh, the, the former mother country and the new United States. In the early days of the war, fighting took place near the Great Lakes in Canada, spreading to the oh, yeah, they had, region they had in Canada. But on August 24th, 1814, in the blistering heat, President Madison would meet with an emergency war council near the Navy Yard after learning that British soldiers had, five days earlier, landed southeast of Washington, D.C. and were making their way up the nearby Patuxent River. A spy reported 45 large craft and many more small boats, according to Anthony Pitch. Their enemy, so eagerly taunted by America's war hawk congressman, was on course to literally march into town. Old President Madison, he's having, how long, how much time has elapsed here? Yeah, about two years. He's Since having himself a quite the term then. Oh, retire after yeah. that shit. Hey, yo, fuck this. Somebody else do it. Has that ever happened? A president's like, ah, oh, fuck this. I don't want to do this. Hopefully I, soon. I, oh. no. <laughs> no one's ever resigned for the reason being too much work. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to go pick some apples. I'd be pretty... It, it's interesting. There have been people who resigned 
for stupid reasons, but not from the presidency. Uh, the presidency has not had that sort of case. I remember, uh, everybody remembers Sarah Palin. This wasn't that long ago. Uh, when Obama ran for president the first time, he ran against John McCain. And his vice presidential candidate was uh, Sarah Palin. And, uh, yeah, she was the governor of Alaska. And I guess she walked away from her governor position before her term elapsed. And it seems that she did it because she was becoming like a reality TV star. So it went from like, uh, okay, public service. Okay, now let's make money. And that was really funny. And I don't think anybody was really that sad to see her go anyway. But uh, there, that's as close as I can think. I, I can't think of an example where it's like too much work, but it was like, hey, let's make some bread. Pretty well begun. <laughs> there were roughly 4,500 British troops to America's 5,500, but the defenders were in for an uphill battle. Many of the British troops had previously fought in the Napoleonic Wars, which left them hardened. Real tough boys. At their They're command tough. were General Robert Ross and Admiral George Cockburn. Cockburn? <laughs> Admiral Cockburn, in particular, was an imposing figure. He was so Cyprus. revered by the British military that he was handpicked to transport Napoleon to a life of exile on the island of St. Helena. Do you think they became friends along the way? And no, I actually read his diary from the trip, and he didn't seem to like him. Aww. I imagined it oh, was I'd, just Oh, I'd love to check that Napoleon, out. Which sounds like a really fun buddy cop drama. Cockburn and Napoleon. <laughs> Admiral Cockburn had also made a... I wouldn't even think about that. Like, oh, he, he was supposed to negotiate. He, I'm sorry, totally like losing my words. He was supposed to escort Napoleon uh, to this island. Would they, did, how, what was their relationship like? I, I wouldn't even think about that. I, and now I'm more inspired to check out uh, some of the primary material on that. Because um, that would be really interesting. I'm I really like the War of 1812. I think it's a very interesting time, and I think uh, broadening it to a more British perspective would be kind of cool. Uh, especially understanding uh, who was in charge over there. The name for himself. Let me go. Cockburn. <laughs> Very Admiral fun. Cockburn had also made a name for himself stateside. During the war, he became infamous for his destructive campaign in the Chesapeake region, plundering settlements and setting them ablaze. According to author Anthony Pitch, Cockburn was so despised that one American claimed he would pay five hundred dollars for each of the admiral's ears and a thousand dollars for his head. Damn! Ooh. How much is that today's rate? Can you? Uh, uh, do you have that? Gotta do the conversions, <laughs> man. <laughs> Maybe next time do a little more research. Have yeah. that right there pop up. We can tell you how much it is. <laughs> just like, keep asking for things to pop up. Yo, it's a lot of money. Was back in those days, I was just like, like, yo, just chop people's ears off for no reason. Oh, you just chop the ears off, say, yeah, these are Cockburns. Oh, yeah, there's so no I way to prove it. There's no really DNA. Proof. Then you buy yourself a nice yacht. I mean, they would find out pretty quickly that he's not dead. If you haven't killed him, um, if he's actually dead, then we have an interesting conversation here. Uh, <laughs> that's actually really funny. But you don't want to uh, piss off the guy who's putting a bounty on somebody's ears and head. Uh, ima imagine uh, crossing that guy and him finding out, oh, they lied to me. What am I going to do about it? I, <laughs> I would fear retribution was living up to his reputation. Pitch says that, quote, his spies and captives had deepened his already intimate knowledge of the area, and he was confident of a quick conquest. Admiral Cockburn oh, I bet. may have been even more confident if he knew what he was up against. The state of the American forces was uh, not great. Many of the soldiers were wearing months winter ago. clothing, even though it was August, and many of them were without boots or flints for their muskets. According to historian Alan Taylor, the soldiers had only been trained one day per year, and the day was usually spent drinking in the local tavern. Alan Taylor is fantastic. Um, Civil War of 1812 is a great book by him. Also, if you're into the American Revolution, check out, uh, I believe it's just called The American Revolution, uh, A Continental History. That's also a very good book. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, I just thought I'd point that out.
We won one war, and all of a sudden we think we're the fucking bell of the Just ball. Kinda... Well, we okay. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know what? We deserve to lose. <laughs> During that same council, President Madison was also informed that the enemy troops moving ever nearer to the capital were marching on the town of Bladensburg, located only six miles north of Washington, D.C. The American generals rallied their shitty troops and prepared to meet them head on. President Madison himself rode along with them, carrying two pistols. Pretty cool for the president, I'm not going to lie. James Madison, he served in a militia at one point, but, like, didn't actually do anything significant with them. Since he is uh, not, he was kind of a sickly dude, he he definitely wouldn't have worked out in any military capacity. This is just, like, he's flexing his muscles a little bit here. Um... That's kind of funny, though. The, the thought of Madison. The guy is like uh, five foot nothing, uh, a acting like he's all that, and he's about to get destroyed. He thinks he's fucking Laura Croft. Yo, that's, that's what we need. We need the president to go to war with everybody. It doesn't work out that well. You watch Game of Thrones? <laughs> now, what about this Madison riding? I mean, George Washington led an army as president, but also he's George Washington. Uh, I, I, I believe it when he does it, when uh, James Madison does it, it, it feels like uh, he's just trying to uh, do something for his own personal dignity, which is weird, because it never seemed like the type of thing that James Madison was super interested in. He always seemed happy being a legislator. And the fact that he was the guy who declared war, he was the president who declared war on England, uh, is actually insane to me. I would have thought it would have been literally anybody else. Uh, maybe John Adams does it. It's unlikely, but it, it feels more likely than James Madison. Thomas Jefferson, maybe he would do it, but the idea of James Madison being the, the, the American to declare a real war after the revolution, it just doesn't seem to fit his personality that well. But it happened. It's, that's real life. Getting into battle with two pistols. It's pretty stupid. Considering the uh, the training of the staff he's riding in with, it doesn't seem like they're exactly the, the best assembled group of soldiers. It's quite the motley crew. We are born of idiocy. When American troops met with the yeah. British forces at Bladensburg, it was um, uh, confusing for me oh, as yeah? a reader. Look, a lot happened. All you need to know is that the Americans made a series of strategic blunders. Like, they, they blew it. Military the history is hard. Was firing I understand. Over James Madison's head, which is hilarious. It's been referred to as the, quote, greatest disgrace ever dealt to American arms. Oh, no. I think it's the only time a sitting president has been under fire. Time okay. out. I feel like you're, you're, you're messing with us. I'm not. There's no way Maybe. they had rockets back then. They did have rockets. They, they were, were just very just, bad. Yeah, like 4th of July fireworks. They're probably firing Roman candles at his head. Basically. Was like James <laughs> Madison just like <laughs> pissing his pants? We can't say for sure, but I would be. <laughs> yeah, they were urine soaked for sure. That horse had piss all over its back. Oh my god, mm -hmm. that's sad. The whole thing resulted in the American military retreating from the area and essentially rolling out a red carpet for British forces to head into Washington, D.C. Way to go, guys. Back in Washington, D.C., Dolly Madison was perhaps not as concerned as she should be the first lady had set the table for a 3 p.m dinner people seem to love dolly madison and i can't help but appreciate her uh even if you don't like all the presidents there are some of the early first ladies that uh, there are some things about them that i can appreciate um i think abigail adams is very interesting martha washington is a little less interesting, but she's got some interesting stuff about her. Um, Dolly Madison gets a lot of respect, and she's one of the few people to walk out of the War of 1812 with more respect. Uh, I think everybody else, uh, there's her and Andrew Jackson. They, they, that's, that's the two people who walked out and everybody's like, wow, they're awesome. Expecting her husband and about 40 other people. Though she had received correspondence from a woman who was scheduled to visit for a social call the day before that politely read, In the present state of alarm and bustle of preparation for the worst that may happen, I imagine it will be more convenient to dispense. You want to join me? Awesome. Awesome. Perry's joining us today. I, I thought he was not going to. He, he's been off doing his own thing this whole time. Uh... 
Here's Paradox. If this is your first time here, he's he's my co-host. With the enjoyment of your hospitality today. That is a great way to cancel plans. We're all going to die. Maybe we shouldn't get tea today. Yeah, maybe move book yeah. club to next week. I mean, they also planned a 3 p.m. dinner, which, like, that's a mistake all on its own. There is sometimes serenity in being totally fucked. Do you know, like, the... Like the folks on the, on the Titanic, they were playing violins as the ship was going down. It's true. That's you an interesting thought. Especially if it was like you had all the fancy food already. Well, There's like, it. you know, probably some duck. I just, you know, crack open that duck. I mean, they have time to get out of there. They have a little bit of time. They, they could get out of there possibly at this point. However, if you're in a position where you absolutely could not get out of there... Yeah, just sit there and enjoy your dinner, man. Start eating it. And if they kill me, I'll be like, well, I had a good meal, so you can't take that from me, sir. Proceed. So you mean to tell me nobody here, Shane, you want to run? I'd probably be packing my bags. I would. Thank you. Thank no, you, you uh, wouldn't. You would, you would join us for duck, I think. It's a scary scene that's unfolding. Ghosts are scarier. <laughs> Elsewhere in the city, panic was beginning to take hold. When concerned citizens crowded the mayor and asked what he would do if the British entered town, he said he would take arms and defend the city, that he'd rather perish in the streets than give up Washington, D.C. But he also said that if everyone else, along with the military, was choosing to abandon the city, then he would do the same thing and leave as well. <laughs> this is this is textbook American flexing right here. Like, I would rather die. And, and of course, like... You're not going to die alone, though. <laughs> if literally everybody else is on the same page, like, I'm not going to be the one guy who walks out. Okay, that that's funny. I didn't know much about uh, this guy specifically, so that's that's funny. <laughs> I mean, this is honest. I love that. I think that's pretty funny. He's like, I, from my cold, dead hands, unless everybody leaves, and then I'm going to go. With mounting dread, the inhabitants of Washington began to flee the city. When word reached the First Lady, she quickly packed up her ship and hauled out of there, famously demanding a portrait of George Washington be torn from its frame and taken for safekeeping. Safe America wins symbolism in this war. We'll say that. Like... That's not even true, because the White House gets burnt down. So, I guess that's not right. Uh, America gets a few little wins in symbolism here. And this is one of them. Demanding a portrait of George Washington be torn from its frame and taken for safekeeping. Save that picture if possible, she said. If not possible, destroy it under no circumstances. Allow it to fall into the hands of the British. Art fact! Yeah, they were having a hard time removing the frame, so she told them to just, like, take a knife and cut it. And now it's, like, one of the most famous paintings of all time. Is it a national treasure? That's what I was about to say. Nicolas Cage. I'm sure he'll come up a lot. And I've not actually seen uh, any of those movies but they sound great <laughs> uh, she gets so much respect for saving that painting i don't even know how much everybody would have thought about it before like yeah okay a painting of george washington ends up in the hands of the british it's definitely not a moment of of dignity there and i guess by making a thing and being like okay we are taking the time, we have the courage to save this painting of George Washington, they made it a moment of dignity, which is really cool. They didn't have to have that. Out of all this, it's all going to be extremely embarrassing for everybody, for James Madison, uh, just for the country in general, and Dolly Madison's going to be walking out looking real good with a painting of George Washington under her arm. So that, that's really cool as we do more of these. The whole affair seems to have fired up Dolly Madison as she later wrote to a friend that she wished she could have remained and held down the fort if I could have had a cannon through every window. But alas, those who should have placed them there fled. She's kind of cool. she felt betrayed. She said, get big. For what it's worth, I'd be a coward in war. Then, yeah. Would you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, 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 you can say whatever you want about me. I'll be alive. My father always told me, don't have more balls than brains. Oh, shit. Oh. You should embroider that on a pillow or something. Put it on a mug. Similar Oof. preservation efforts were being made by the staff of Secretary of State James Monroe, who preserved the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, among other important documents. But James Monroe is going to be a big part of the War of 1812. I don't know how much we're going to get into it. We're only about halfway done with this video, so we might. Um, he's going to basically take over before the war is over. He's going to be... Uh, James Madison's gonna step aside a little bit and let James Monroe run. It, like, James Monroe has military history. He has 
good leadership instincts, and he's going to be considered one of the better presidents. Maybe on the lower scale of that, but people will generally agree that James Monroe is one of the better presidents. By just after sunset, 90% of the residents had fled the city. On his way out of town, one man walked past the White House and, seeing it empty, recalled feeling, quote, that the metropolis of our country is abandoned to its horrible fate. How did we come back from this? This is the one moment in every disaster or war movie where everyone is just deflated. Like an yeah. Independence Day when the aliens blow our shit up. Yeah. It's like, oh, we're fucked now. This is the part mm. where where like the ships are positioned above the skyscrapers and everyone's just looking at them. But where's Will Smith with a cigar in his mouth? When's he coming? More importantly, where's Jeff Goldblum? Who the hell is Goldblum? <laughs> James Monroe is Will Smith. Jesse Park. I like Jesse Park. Steven Spielberg's one of my favorites. You, so wait, wait a second. Wait, what's or maybe it's Andrew oh, Jackson. Is that the guy with the glasses? Know. Yes. Oh, uh, you should have said it's the other guy in the ship with That'd Will Smith. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just after sunset, the British arrived on Capitol Hill. Moving from building to building, they piled up furniture, covered it in gunpowder, and set it ablaze. Over the course of the evening, they would set fire to the Library of Congress, the Supreme Court, the House and Senate chambers, the Treasury, the War and State Department building, and famously, the White House. Pitch describes... So the term the White House, this is one of those little fun facts things this doesn't matter that much uh it officially was called the white house during teddy roosevelt's time but and a lot of people are like oh that that's when they started calling it the white house no they were calling it the white house long before then i don't know if it was here or after the reconstruction of the white house post war of 1812 it might have started after that but i don't don't quote me on that exactly but the white house term was a nickname for the white house for a very very long time before uh, it, and it, before it ended up the way, it, it, the way it is now. Um, yeah, this, this is a really interesting video. I love their visuals. There's something really cool about this. Um, yeah, let's the see what we got. The sight through the eyes of an onlooker. Quote, a deafening explosion resounded across the Potomac River. He reached a hill and gasped at the devastation. The capital was burning. As the flames took hold, the magnitude of the calamity struck home. Holy shit. Imagining the White I agree. House aflame. I feel like I haven't seen any movies about this. Yeah. That is true. And this seems like a very badass yeah. story to tell. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I think the War of 1812 is often uh, underrated. I've gone through it in like my public education history a little bit, but it's always really quick. It's always considered like... This is the second war for independence, and we had it again, and we kind of won, and Andrew Jackson came out of it. Well, that's all we really need to talk about. Um, it's definitely far more complicated than that, and I don't blame people for not knowing much about it, because really, there there is not a lot of emphasis put on it in our history. Maybe because it's not one of our most uh, proud moments in history. I, I think it's far more interesting because of how uh, uh, tragic some of the results were. I guess, like, we don't really make a lot of movies where America gets smacked around a little bit. Yeah, the British same troops rationale. tasked with burning down the state and house buildings were allegedly remorseful about burning down what they discovered to be rather beautiful buildings, but Aww. they carried out their orders, and the fires there melted plate glass and left the columns of the buildings deformed and shaking. Despite the rampant arson, the British weren't monsters. They were ordered to leave private homes untouched, and this order was mostly followed. The patent office was also left untouched because it was argued that patents were private property. What a this is interesting because burning down the White House is a symbolic victory. Uh, they don't, uh, they're, they're not burning it, some of it they are, some of the stuff they're burning down is obviously for strategic reasons, but the burning of the Capitol building is a huge symbolic victory. It's supposed to deflate the Americans. They, they should, uh... They'll, they'll be hanging their heads low in shame after this. You want Americans to think, wow, I don't even want to fight this war anymore. I feel so bad about this whole thing. That is what you're trying to get here. If you end up oppressing the people and hurting ordinary people, that might end up firing them up. And then uh, the deflating that's supposed to happen from the burning of the capital city may end up being counteracted with a feeling of uh, 
resentment towards the British who uh, hurt ordinary people and uh, damaged things that they just didn't didn't have to to win the war. Respectful argument. So while yes, they're walking smart. around, burning down the whole city, yeah. they're like, this one? No. This one? Americans would have never not burned Everything. these things. Americans would have been like, fire, 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 yeah. fire, fire, fire. Even the British were like, mm, the architecture Maybe. is beautiful. <laughs> we're not a country really known for our restraint, but I do love the fact that there was some British general that was like, whoa, wait a second, guys. Let's, let's think about this. <laughs> Patents, though. The British also raided the National Intelligence Service newspaper office. Admiral Cockburn is said to have stolen all the letter C's from their presses to... Pre Before I continue here, I, I'm just thinking, like, America has, at this point, stolen trade secrets from the British. Uh, that's how they built the state I live in. And uh, that's how they built the Rhode Island economy up a little bit more. We were one of the big textile manufacturers based off of stolen trade secrets from the British. And the fact that they respect uh, the the patents of ordinary people is also kind of it, it makes that a little bit funnier like we don't care we're gonna steal your secrets and build trade off of it and you're gonna just totally leave that stuff alone that's really funny prevent them <laughs> Patents, though. The British also raided the National Intelligence Service newspaper office. Admiral Ooh. Cockburn is said to have stolen all the letter C's from their presses to prevent them from printing negative reports about him. Good okay. Bet. And for the main event, the White House. Upon their arrival, the troops were delighted to find that the house was not only deserted, but that a lovely meal had been set out and completely abandoned. As Pitch describes, quote, the sight of such abundant food and wine exhilarated them. Oh, they should have poisoned it. Elegantly. They ate the duck. See, if you would have ate the duck earlier, you wouldn't have given them this luxury. They got a victory meal that you prepared for them. I do like that they were so wonderfully yeah. surprised by this and yeah. decided. <laughs> it's starting to sound like a Dr. Seuss book. The soldiers were said to have stolen and souvenirs and made toasts to peace with America and down with Madison. One lieutenant even changed into one of Madison's presumably luxurious shirts. Another stole one of the president's hats and That's placed funny. it on his bayonet, saying that if they couldn't capture the quote little president, they could at least show off his hat back home. James Madison was the shortest man to ever be president. That is an important thing because a lot of leaders, uh, somehow a lot of them end up being around six feet tall or taller. And that, that's interesting. And the ones that are shorter don't get a lot of respect. John Adams didn't get a lot of respect. He was my height. James Madison, even shorter than me. That's even, that, And just I, to imagine that guy running a country, it says a lot about the symbolism that comes with that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is just a fun romp now. You know what would be a really fun way for this story to end is if they just don't leave the house at all. They're like, you know what? I kind of like it here. They just stayed there. They rented out as an Airbnb. The general just kind of kicked back behind the, the desk and said, you know what? I could get used to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. A good time was had by all. And then they set on fire. Yeah. A few days later, after traveling through Virginia and having insults ah. repeatedly hurled at him, President Madison would seek refuge at a small Quaker community in Maryland. After being turned away from one home, he was welcomed into another. How badass <laughs> would it be to turn away yeah. the press? They went to that would be house amazing. and asked if he could stay there to seek refuge, and they said no. I would have said no, too, just from a safety standpoint. Like, Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like, If you're housing the president after he's fled the capital, like, the British are probably not going to touch ordinary Joe Schmo's house on the countryside. They, they really, it, you actually stand a pretty good chance of being okay there if they don't have, like, a strategic reason to uh, destroy it. Um, but if you have the president, uh, y who knows? Your life could get totally destroyed here. I don't want to put a big target on my home. One account says that, quote, every now and then he would become very quiet and ask questions. At one point he said, do you think they burned my library? Someone in the group said, so Your Excellency, they burned your whole palace. He didn't even ask about his wife. 
<laughs> Good. Dolly's fine, by the way. Don't call it a palace. I, I felt sorry for him, and then they called it a palace, and I said, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah they would call it the presidential mansion, the presidential palace. For the, that's just uh, the terminology of the time. Um, James Madison loved his books more than life itself, and I think he understood that Dolly was going to be okay. Uh, that's not, they're going to look real bad if they do something bad to, uh, Dolly Madison. I, th I think she'd be treated with the utmost dignity. I did find it odd in this that they allegedly called him your excellency because George Washington specifically told people not to call him your highness because we, at the time, were obviously moving away from the whole monarchy, yeah. monarchy thing, which is yeah. why we say Mr. President. Well, yeah. these people who took yeah. him in are obviously dummies anyway. And he's a Democratic Republican. They're supposed to be the men of the people or whatever, but uh, he he's being called your highness. Isn't that interesting? Uh, James Madison, it's weird when you're basically an aristocrat and you're in the party of the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, come on, shack up. What? Oh, got what, you got a bunch of British after you? Whatever. The fires were still burning the next day, but things were about to change. As the yeah. afternoon rolled around, the sky began to darken. Thunder and lightning signified something s -s significant. The storm would hit that afternoon. Based on the descriptions of its destruction, some have suggested it was a hurricane. It reportedly spawned multiple Dude. tornadoes. One British soldier gave a harrowing account of the devastation, quote, of the prodigious force of wind, it is impossible for you to form any conception. Roofs of houses were torn off by a and whisked into the air like sheets of paper. Sure. So on top of... If I learned anything about this hurricane, I must have forgotten it, because that that's a, an important detail that I, I don't remember. Um... I'm sure it was in the Alan Taylor book, but it's also very long, so it's easy to forget details. The This fire and war, there's now a storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with multiple tornadoes. So nobody took a picture of this. <laughs> nobody took a picture of this. <laughs> nobody no. snapped this. But so this, is a, this is a real thing that happened. I don't multiple think they did. Multiple tornadoes that one day. Yeah. It coincidentally after this war thing. Some people have called this the storm that saved Washington. This is, this is, this is where the aliens this is come this in, sure. Clearly aliens. This is, clearly this aliens. is not aliens. This is aliens, coincidence. Aliens, multiple tornadoes in Washington, D.C. It does sound like Independence Day. It's not like Independence That's Day. That's how I've been picturing this the whole time. I mean, it's yes. fair of you to picture that, because there is a lot of destruction, but there are no it's, aliens. It's nice of you to finally all the history, come to All the history was destroyed. I'm not going to entertain this any further. <laughs> He's going to put it in the episode. British troops and established locals alike were both terrified. Around them, trees were being uprooted. Older buildings were literally being lifted off their foundations and smashed. Soldiers reportedly broke ranks. Fleeing. One... You know what? Now I do remember this. It, this is definitely something that I, I've gone through in the, in the Alan Taylor book. It, it, this is... This is great imagery, too. Like, I'm, I'm so... I'm so into how they edit these things. The soldier was thrown from his horse and watched in awe as two cannons were lifted into the air. It is funny to imagine a British soldier on his horse just being like, oh, oh! Yeah. <laughs> Cannons flying around. Yeah. It's crazy. I was going to have a funny little model for this where I would set it on fire. They won't let me have any flames here. So instead, I figured oh, we'd man. put some of the budget towards just a graphical representation of this happening. So I'll just narrate this, and I want you all to react as if it's happening right here with some very good graphics. So here's sure. the White House. Wow. Oh, wow. Love it. Here come some British nice. soldiers. Uh oh. <laughs> they're marching in. Now they're in there. Oh. They're exiting and it's catching on fire. Whoa. Okay. Hey, now maybe it's this is what we've bit. spoken about. And they look very Hooray. pleased with Yay. themselves, don't they? Yay. But here comes Mr. Tornado. It's a yeah. These graphics this, are amazing. This is amazing, this is yeah. React. Yeah. Holy shit, that's fucking like a tornado. It's the wow. Transformers. And that's the oh, end, everybody. No. Yay, that's good. Okay. You're a wizard. All right, good, thank you. According to one story, Admiral Cockburn exclaimed to a local woman, <laughs> Great God, madam, is this the kind of storm to which you are accustomed in this infernal country? To which the lady replied, No, sir. This is a special interposition of providence to drive our enemies from our city. The admiral, getting in one last jab. Yeah, that was really bad timing, isn't it? It is rather to aid your enemies in the destruction of your city. 
The British packed up their things and left town out of concern that U.S. forces could block their way out. Days later, Attorney General Richard Rush suggested that maybe the government should issue a statement in an attempt to spin the whole occupation as less of an embarrassment than it actually was. They did so and essentially reframed the whole ordeal as an act of vandalism. And I thought for most of my life that we won this war. I was under the impression that the U.S. did not lose a war until the 20th century. Uh, and that would... And that's still, like, a little bit weird. Um, this feels like a loss. I, un I understand Andrew Jackson's gonna get the last laugh or whatever, but did we gain anything from it? Not of great significance. Um... Did, did we lose anything? I, I think we lost a lot. We've lost lives. We lost infrastructure. We definitely lost a lot uh, in the burning of the capital city. Like, there, there's plenty of precious documents that are probably lost. Uh, and, yeah, it's there's nothing that can really outweigh that except, like, total unconditional surrender by the British, and that's just not what we got not a crushing military defeat. Historian Alan Taylor said, quote, the losers are writing the history as if they were victors. So we did not Very win good. this war. Mother Nature just came in and, like, helped us. Hey, you know what? This Could isn't even the how, though. The narrative. I, I think it's very I commendable know. that they were able to, to recover from this enormous embarrassment. Yeah. Part of me is upset that they did that and lied, because I feel like we're still sort of doing that today. And the other part of me is, like, if we didn't have that like emotional bolstering as a country we probably wouldn't have made it at all i think it's badass that's that we really lost good thinking we were still like nah we won and then we said it long enough and hard enough that we finally believed it the war of 1812 would draw to a close a few months later with the treaty of ghent hey basically had all it's my boy to return to the way things were before the whole crazy affair began the british were exhausted and america probably had a lot of cleaning up to do after that hilarious prank those zany british yeah. soldiers pulled on them you know setting our entire capital on fire the real bummer to me is that we stopped speaking so eloquently at some point down the road, and now the history of today is going to be told through hashtags and shorthand. Bring back Wobegon. The Americans, they weren't pre That is... I am I am kind of dreading what it's going to be like to do history, uh, modern history, like decades down the line, because, yeah, we will have to use social media. We will have to use all of these unconventional sources that we're just not used to. Uh, it's going to change everything. It's going to be studied in an entirely different way. It's like if you study this stuff compared to studying uh, uh, stuff from, like, BCE, like that sort of stuff. Like, the, the sources are just on a different scale. Uh, and I think having more information can sometimes make it more difficult because you have to sort through the good and the bad information you have just way more to sort through so I'm, I'm i'm both excited and dreading what future historians are gonna have to do i'm gonna try to stay focused on this stuff though so i don't want to have to deal with it prepared they didn't know what was going on maybe they just needed a kick in the butt to sort of get their shit together people maybe. have said that this war is what sort of uh, solidified the so. American identity as a country. Or maybe did it galvanize us a little bit, perhaps? You know. Uh, maybe, maybe afterwards everyone was like, all right, let's get our shit together. Yeah, let's get our shit together and be a country. Like sometimes I go to Taco Bell, I order too much there, and I feel like a real piece of shit after. And I go, you know what? I gotta pick it up after this. Time so. for some and then celery. You go right back. And then I go right back after, you know? So it's ebb and flow. Ebb and flow. Ebb and flow. So you'll I never learn. That, I'll never learn. And that's the War of 1812, or at least a little bit of it. Baby steps. Yeah, it's a little bit. I mean, there's bit. a whole thing where Andrew Jackson continued to fight it after it, it was over, because he was insane uh, and an asshole. But, you know, maybe we'll get to that some other time. For now, that's been Rooting History. Thanks for looking at this. Aw, man, I was, I was hoping we'd get to the Andrew Jackson thing. There is a thing, and uh, the war was officially over, but Andrew Jackson continued to fight. Uh, and he got one final victory at the end that we kind of bank on. But, like, it was over. It was over. But that's, like, the the victory we tie to uh, our, vic our, uh, our idea of victory, I guess. We, 
when we try to say like we were the winners of this war, we got this. A lot will point to the Andrew Jackson thing because it was very impressive. But the war was over, and the only question is, and I've heard accounts from both sides, so I'm not going to make an affirmative uh, claim. Uh, did he know that the war was over and go ahead anyway, or were there miscommunications? I'd like to think that he knew the war was over because it's way more interesting. Um, that was a very fun video. I really like what these people are doing. Uh, they made history fun. Uh, the visuals are some of the best I've seen when it comes to history content on YouTube. So I, I'm, I'm down to check out more of this. I got to see some of the other subjects they've covered. I know they did one on Benjamin Franklin that I saw like a long time ago. Uh, I don't know if I'll end up revisiting that one, but I'll see what else they've done. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, like this video and uh, subscribe for more every day. I will see you guys next time. Thank you for watching. Later.